Hi, welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. Um, you know, we've had some really startling developments here in Israel since our last uh, since our last uh, show, and I just want to go over the one that I find most startling. Um, Israel today, as uh, Prime Minister designate uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his coalition partners move pretty quickly towards signing and completing their. Uh, coalition deals that uh, will form the basis of their uh, new government, um, we're seeing a multifaceted challenge to Israel's democratic governance on the part of the outgoing government led by Yair Lapid, the outgoing prime minister, and his coalition partners in uh, his party, in the Yeshatid party, in Benny Gantz's party, in the Labor Party, um, and then from outside groups as well. Essentially, the losing parties in Israel's elections are presenting Israel domestically and internationally as if we're two separate nations. Uh, the First Nation, of course, is theirs and it's democratic. It has all the right values. It has all the right policies. And the incoming Netanyahu government and its voters are the dark forces in Israeli society. They're illegitimate. They're anti-democratic, misogynist, xenophobic, uh, racist. Um, homophobic, um, fascist, you name it. It's all of those. And, and, you know, and a bag of chips, as a friend of mine would say. Um, and uh, there are unsettled calls by uh, Lapid and his colleagues to the legal fraternity here in Israel, led by the Supreme Court, to block the Knesset's ability to legislate, to block the incoming government's ability to govern uh, from the bench and from uh, the legal advisor's office. Um, Lapid met with the general staff of the IDF last week and essentially encouraged them to rebel against Netanyahu and his government and to reject its authority to uh, give orders, which is, um, among other things, a uh, call for rebellion, which is a felony in this country. But, you know, who cares? Um, he wrote a letter, a letter uh, from the prime minister's office on the prime minister's office letterhead to the heads of local governing authorities in Israel calling for them not to work with the incoming government and not to accept legitimacy of its education policies and its other social policies. Um, this is something that is unprecedented in Israeli history. I mean, it's a call for rebellion. Um, and um, you have other people in the outgoing uh, coalition. You have Two former IDF chiefs of staff, Gadi Eisenkot, who is, uh, I think, number three in uh, uh, former IDF chief of staff and current outgoing de defense minister Benny Gantz's party. He, together with uh, former prime minister, former defense minister, former chief of staff of the IDF, Ehud Barak, have called for a million Israelis to go to the streets to oppose the incoming government. And again, the government hasn't even been formed. It hasn't been sworn in. It hasn't implemented one policy. Um, but there are calls for open rebellion, a million people going into the streets. What is that really a call for? It's a call for January 6th on steroids. It's a call for civil war. That's what it's a call for. All that they're doing is putting people into a tinderbox and uh, at whatever moment they choose, they'll light a match. That's what's happening right now in Israel. We've never seen anything like it before. Never. It's incredibly dangerous and it's incredibly irresponsible. And yes, it's incredibly anti-democratic. You have a resounding victory for the right wing bloc led by Benjamin Netanyahu to form the next government. They're about to form the next government. They're moving fairly systematically. I would say it's too slow for my taste, but that's what we have. And uh, they're doing it very methodically and they're building a coalition that they hope is going to stand the test of time and all of the uh, slings and of uh, outrageous fortune and arrows of outrageous fortune that uh, the opposition is now throwing at them. But the, uh, in the, but the opposition, of course, isn't only directing its efforts at what they're going to be doing inside of Israel, but they're also uh, pushing out this message of the fundamental illegitimacy and evil uh, of the forces of darkness that are forming the next government under Netanyahu to the international community. And we're seeing that their messages are resonating in the noxious uh, coverage that Netanyahu and his allies are receiving, particularly in the American media. Um, last week, I wrote an article about this that's appearing this week in Newsweek. Uh, two senior uh, Middle East hands in the foreign policy establishment in Washington, former US ambassador to Israel, Dan Kurtzer, and former uh, deputy envoy for Middle East peace, 
under, I think, three administrations, Aaron da David Miller penned an article in the Washington Post where they called for the Biden administration to, an ad to adopt a viciously hostile policy towards Israel, really um, adopting the positions that are being pushed out by anti-Israel legislators like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashida Tlaib and others, uh, Kurtzer and Aaron Miller, who are also prominent in the American Jewish community, called for the Biden administration to uh, have uh, to adopt anticipatory sanctions against the incoming Israeli government and against Israel in anticipation of that government being sworn in. Among other things, they called for the United States to place an embargo on the sale of offensive weapon systems to Israel. They called on the United States, on the Biden administration, which, as we know, is incredibly hostile towards Israel, right, to stop U.S. support for Israel at the United Nations, at the International Court of Justice, uh, Court of, uh, sorry, the International Criminal Court at The Hague. Um, you know, these are the policies that have been advocated by administration members like Maher Bittar and Hadi Amar, who are respectively the head of uh, intelligence at the National Security Council and uh, the newly minted uh, envoy to the Palestinians of the uh, Biden administration. So these are these are viciously anti-Israel policies. They've also called for uh, incoming ministers in Israel's government from the religious Zionism party, uh, Bitsala Smotrich and Itamar Ben-Gvir to be treated as persona non grata and for the United States government not to work with them, which is incredible. And then finally, and most astonishingly, Kurtzer and Miller, again, two prominent members of the U.S. foreign policy establishment on the Middle East, and also two prominent members of the American Jewish communities, called on the administration to punish Israel's peace partners in the Arab world, in the in the Abraham Accords, to, to strike out against Morocco, Bahrain, the UAE, and Sudan for effectively ending the Palestinian veto over the peace between Israel and the Arab world by signing the Abraham Peace Accords uh, with Israel not uh, 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 first um, kowtowing and accepting every Palestinian demand, which cumulatively and separately would lead to the destruction of the Jewish state. So, I mean, these are the policies that they're, that they're pushing for, and they're doing so, they're justifying this by aping the language, by mimicking, by, by speaking the language that, that Lapid is creating with his policy, with his, with his, uh, with his actions to demonize the incoming Israeli government and to incite a rebellion against it again before it's even been formed, uh, you know they telegraphed uh, their plan, Lapid and his and his colleagues, and also their friends on in on the other side of the pond in the United States. They telegraphed their intention to demonize this government, you know, for the past many years by demonizing Netanyahu and demonizing the Israeli right as the forces of darkness, as somehow you know, inherently criminal and evil and people who must be, you know, kept away from power at all costs. Um, and now they're actually implementing this policy towards an elected government in Israel. Um, again, we're going into very dark times. And I'm going to have as my guest on uh, on this program today, uh, a very dear old friend of mine, uh, Mort Klein, who's the president of the Zionist Organization of America. We're planning on talking about Know, how the American Jewish community is dealing with rising anti-Semitism in Israel. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one of the points that you have to look to is that when you look at the Israeli left demonizing their political opponents on the right, including uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, starting with him and moving down the list, um, they are making it possible for American Jews to abandon Israel and to not understand that by abandoning their support for the state of Israel, they're also harming their ability to fight against the rising anti-Semitism that's directed against them personally, directly. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what's happening here. It's alarming. Uh, obviously, um, we'll uh, continue to inform you about the situation on JNS, and I, of course, will do so in my in my writings. Uh, but it's very important for 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 all of you to understand where we stand. And and without further ado, I I want to I want to turn to my conversation with with Mort Klein, uh, the president of the ZOA. 
talk about what's happening specifically in the American Jewish uh, uh, Jewish community vis-a-vis you know, -vis Israel and vis-a-vis -vis the fight against anti-Semitism. So thanks so much. I'm so happy to have with me today Mort Klein, the head of uh, ZOA, the president of the Zionist Organization of America. Uh, Mort and I have known each other uh, for a few years, but he's been, uh, for many years, in fact, but he's been president of the ZOA throughout all of them, which makes sense because uh, I may have known him a long time, but I haven't known him 29 years. And at the end of December, he will have he will be entering into his 30th year as the president of the ZOA. Um, and, uh, you know, Mort is one of the most outspoken champions of a strong U.S.-Israel alliance and of uh, strong Zionism and support among American Jews uh, for Israel, probably the strongest, most consistent voice on these very important topics. So um, we have a lot to discuss. So without further ado, I just want to welcome you more to the uh, Carolyn Glick Show. It's about time I have you here. So I'm well, it's here. great to be with the greatest journalist on the Arab-Israeli situation in the world, Caroline Glick. It's a great honor to be with someone as talented, gifted, and as activist as you are. Well, obviously, I have to have you on more often if that's how you refer to it. Your me. mother told me to say that. I'm doing this um, for let's... her. <laughs> okay, well, all right, that's fine. I'll let her know that you said that, and I'll see what she says. She'll probably say, well, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. What's it to you? Anyway, uh, so listen, I wanted to start uh, with, with uh, I, I want to talk to you today about the uh, growing um uh, the rise of anti-Semitism, the open in your face, uh, can't deny anti-Semitism in the United States. And, you know, I was with you just uh, uh, last month. I had the honor of uh, joining you at the uh, at the uh, ZOA Awards dinner, your your annual dinner. And you bestowed uh, a very, uh, a very uh, extraordinary award on uh, former President Donald Trump for his great friendship. Uh, with uh, Israel and all the wonderful things that he's done for Israel, he did as president for Israel, including moving the embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, uh, ending U.S. support for the terror, supporting uh, Palestinian Authority, and and so many other things that he did that were important, um, and uh, also for his fight against anti-Semitism in the United States on college campuses. And then, lo and behold, about a week after. Uh, we had dinner with President Trump. Um, he had dinner with uh, with two anti-Semites, maybe three, I'm not quite sure, but certain Kanye West has become sort of a combination Louis Farrakhan and, Connor, uh, and Father Coughlin over the past several weeks. And he had him over to dinner again with uh, Kanye's new uh, sidekick, Nick Fuentes. And I personally felt like it was a gut punch uh, on the part of uh, Trump uh, doing this, and he sort of pulled the wind out of the sails of uh, of his supporters, his Jewish supporters in the United States, by by doing this. Um, and first, of, and I know that you put out a statement on it, but I wanted before we expand the discussion, I just want to get your thoughts on what happened there and how and how you look at it, because he's been such an extraordinary friend. Um, and then he went and did this. Uh, how, how do you look at it? Look, Donald Trump uh, has said many times how delighted he is that Kanye West has said great things about him. So obviously, a guy like West uh, uh, salves President Trump's ego, and he likes that. Uh, also, he may think, I don't know this, uh, that by being close to a major uh, black icon, uh, maybe this will help him get more black votes in his uh, quest to uh, become president again. I don't know. <laughs> but with respect to bringing these two anti-Semites, one's a Holocaust-denying anti-Semite, that's Nick Fuentes. Actually, I think that Kanye uh, also denied the Holocaust when he was on the Alex Jones show. Uh, and this week, of course, he publicly praised disgracefully and frighteningly Adolf Hitler and Nazis. <laughs> All we ask Donald Trump, President Trump, to do is repudiate him. Just say his remarks are disgraceful. I condemn them. They have no place in American society. And I will certainly not have anything further to do with these people. And it would have gone away. That's all he had to do. I can't understand why he refused to say anything uh, against them. In fact, uh, even a month ago when he was asked about this before the dinner, all he said was, 
Kanye West has said some rough things about the Jews. That's all he would say. It's not enough. There has to be consequences to this type of Jew hatred by prominent icons, which helps legitimize and mainstream anti-Semitism. And Donald Trump, uh, who did extraordinary things for the Jewish state of Israel, like no one else, we were the we're the only, despite that, we were the only Jewish group to have recognized him and, and told him, we thank you for all this. No one else did. <laughs> and yet he really disappointed us by not, simply not repudiating them. He didn't have to apologize. He didn't have to do anything except repudiate them. It would have gone away. I don't know why he refused to do that, do that but he did. You know, it's really interesting because I, mean, I kind of feel like, I, I mean, you, re, you, you condemned the meeting. Uh, David Friedman, his ambassador to Israel, condemned the meeting as well. I mean, people who are very close to him. In Jason the Greenblatt, Elon Carr, have, have, people close to him. So, okay, I didn't, I haven't been finding So, yeah, so all of all of the uh, Jewish Americans who are working with him most closely during his presidency have all asked him, have all condemned the meeting and asked him to repudiate Kanye West, and he hasn't done that yet. And I I find that so amazing. And And the other thing that I find really disturbing is that you know this this meeting where he really did do something uh, that he that deserves to be condemned because it, it was very dangerous. I mean, Kanye West it really is sort of this meeting point between. I talked about it with uh, with uh, uh, Dumi, Pastor Dumisani Washington on my on my uh, on on my show last week that he really has become this meeting point between black anti-Semitism of the nation of Islam and black Israelite variety and white supremacism and white, white neo-Nazi anti-Semitism. And this is something that I don't remember that we've seen. Um, Dumisani said that uh, Malcolm X identified the, uh, the cooperation, the collaboration between the Ku Klux Klan and the nation of Islam before he was assassinated. But I don't think that we've had any discussion of these sorts of things. We certainly haven't seen it uh, personified in one person the way we're seeing it now with Kanye West. And and I, I have this sense that, you know, for, for six years now, since uh, Donald Trump announced that he was, uh, or since he received the Republican nomination in, in 2016, that uh, the American Jewish community, the, the liberal dominated uh, American Jewish community has been condemning him as an anti-Semite for nothing. For so long that now that he's actually done something that really is alarming, you know, I'm not sure how convincing a case that they can make because it's been, you know, he he didn't he did the exact opposite of what he was accused of doing of being an anti-Semite, of courting anti-Semites, and of and of uh, and of not being a friend to the American Jewish community first and foremost. Putting aside for a second his extraordinary support for the U.S.-Israel alliance. Um, that now that actually something has happened that really is is alarming uh, with his meeting with Kanye West in the middle of a tear of anti-Semitism on West's part, together with his, you know, execrable uh, campaign manager, uh, Nick Fuentes, um, you know, that who's going to who's going to listen to them? And what do you think? No, I'm, I'm afraid that the President Trump has just uh, added to the legitimacy and mainstreaming of Jew hatred and Israel bashing. And I, 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 I think this increased anti-Semitism has really made it easy for Joe Biden to appoint many people who are extremely hostile to Israel in important posts. Every single person Biden has appointed to an important post affecting Israel is hostile to Israel. I can mention a couple of them if, if, if you like. I mean, yeah, I, I think it's important <laughs> to go through the list. I mean, Hadi Amar was just. Oh, wait, before you go through the list, can I before you go through the list, can I just interrupt you for one second? Um, because I think that it's important before we so segue into Joe Biden, because I think that there are two things here. When you say that when when by meeting with Kanye West and refusing to uh, to disavow this this person and to condemn him and to say that it was a mistake and that he won't do it again. That Trump is is actually legitimizing his voice. Um, that it's happening at a time when you know, on the one hand, it's very easy for the the dominant voices in the American Jewish community to condemn him because they've been condemning him for everything. And I worry 
that when somebody like Jonathan Greenblatt from the ADL attacks Trump for meeting with Kanye West because he's been over the top for so long in his condemnation of Trump, when Trump has never been responsible for the kinds of things that, that Greenblatt and the ADL have been accusing him of doing, then now that he says it, people aren't going to take him seriously. People on the right will take him less seriously. People on the right will be less concerned about what he's saying now when actually this is when, you know, Trump has to be made also to account for what he's doing. But that's one aspect. And the other aspect is that this meeting, like you said, is happening in a context of a lot more and a lot more dangerous types of anti-Semitism that are being advanced in the Biden administration. So yeah, first of all, let's talk about who we're talking about and then let's talk first about all, what ADL's we're talking Jonathan about. What Greenblatt do do. has no credibility in, in, in criticizing uh, Donald Trump when he has praised Ilan Omar for a commitment to a more just world. Uh, uh, Ilan Omar, of course, is the radical anti-Israel Jew hater uh, from Minnesota, a congresswoman, uh, who has said that his uh, Jews are bribing congressmen to do uh, to do what Israel wants. Uh, supports boycotting Israel. Uh, calls Israel an evil country, and yet he praised him. He praised her, and he's really never criticized the really important people in official roles in in, what, in government and in Congress that affect Israel. For example, as I said, Hadi Amar just was elevated to a very responsible, more important post, having more influence and power over the uh, Arab-Israeli situation. Uh, and it's remarkable that Jewish leaders or Israeli leaders or anyone has attacked him. Uh, Hadi Amar uh, has condemned the killing of Hamas terrorists. Uh, he's against U.S. military aid. He says America must not veto anti-Israel UN resolutions because it will only uh, uh, come back to bite us. Uh, and he, he co accused Israel of ethnic cleansing, being an apartheid state. And most horrifyingly, he says, I am inspired by the Intifada. He says, I'm inspired by a terror war where they've murdered and maimed 10,000 Jews. Where is ADL screaming about this? Where's AJ Committee? Where's AIPAC? Where, where are Israel leaders? Why, why aren't Israel leaders saying, we are not going to deal with this man. You'll have to give us someone else. And, and, uh, and he's not alone. Mahir Bitar is director of intelligence at the National Security Council who every year had a conference that he headed at Georgetown University, how to demonize Israel, how to demonize Israel. He's in the Board of Students for Justice in Palestine, a vicious Jew-hating Israel bashing group. And he says the reason there's no peace is because Israel will not allow millions of refugees to move back into Israel. It's absurd. And of course, he accused them of apartheid. And, and look, even Anthony Blinken this week brought Ilan Omar, the Jew-hater, to Qatar elevating her, giving her, showing her respect, and announcing he's going to speak at the Israel bashing organization, J Street. Where are Jewish leaders on this? Yes, Trump has been appropriately criticized for what he did, but Hadi Amar is much worse and much more dangerous. Mahir Bitar, uh, Blinken's actions. Why is Israel or, and Jewish leaders silent? It's really frightening. There has to be consequences to people uh, who are promoting and stating uh, about Israel in a, in a harmful and outrageous, uh, disgraceful way. We haven't seen it, and I don't understand it. I've asked other Jewish leaders to speak out about these people, and they say, uh, it's not a good idea, not now. It'll upset the administration. It, you'll make it worse, which is the old fear that Jews have. By speaking out, you'll make it worse. We can no longer be the Shah still Jew. We have to speak out about every one of these appointments. He could... President Biden couldn't keep making one terrible appointment that affects Israel after another if Jewish leaders would have been speaking out about these people. By the way, even Avril Haines, the head of the National Security Council, who's Jewish, has condemned Israeli violence and, and terrorism and says the Democratic platform... National... Uh, yeah, she's a director of National, National Intelligence. National Security Council. She's director of National Security Council. <laughs> and I thought she was director of National Intelligence, the DIA. Oh, well... <laughs> and uh, it's quite interesting. Why is it when Robert Malley was appointed to be the lead negotiator for Iran under Obama, this terrible man who's against sanctions on Iran, who says we should negotiate with Hamas, uh, uh, who says it's okay if Iran gets nuclear weapons. When he was appointed by Malley, the Jewish community uh, 
did speak out strongly, and yet now they're silent. They've said not a word. I, I don't understand what's going on, but I, I, I'll tell you for sure, the Jewish leadership has failed in protecting Israel and Jews. They failed, and people should be calling them out for this. That's actually a good question, because, you know, when, when Obama appointed Chuck Hagel to be the defense secretary, it, there was a huge outcry. Right. I mean, among American Jews, APEC, if I'm not mistaken, actually tried to fight his appointment because of his long record of bashing Israel. And yet we see and Robert Malley as well uh, was highly controversial. Samantha Power was highly controversial and they faced significant headwinds in their um, in in their uh, Senate confirmation hearings. Um, and yet. Under Biden, nobody really faced any scrutiny in their Senate confirmation hearings. There was never uh, from the American Jewish community. There was from Republicans, but you didn't really hear an outcry from organizations like the American Jewish Committee, from APAC, from ADL, over these uh, people's long histories of anti-Semitism. Um, why do you why do you think that is? A change between you know. Uh, Chuck Hagel being being appointed, I think that he was was he at the beginning of Obama's second term, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. What, I, it that? could be. That's what it was. Yeah, I think so. I mean, why why was why was it possible to fight Hagel, but it wasn't possible to fight, um, like you said, um, uh, Meyer Meyer Bitar or uh, Hadi Amar or Avril Haines, or any of these other people. Or even uh, Jean-Pierre, the spokeswoman, who launched organizing yeah, campaign who, who, to stop people, uh, right. officials from going to APAC's conference. And no one said a word about her being appointed the, the, the spokesperson. APAC didn't say a word no, about No, they didn't. <laughs> I mean, APAC, who was her direct victim, said my, nothing. My Why? speculation, look, it's, it's a very important question. I would like to answer myself. <laughs> my speculation... <laughs> is that Jewish leaders and Jewish organizations have been in some part convinced by the phony, the lying propaganda against Israel that they're oppressing Arabs, uh, that there's an occupation of their land, uh, um, uh, that Israel's building settlements all over Judea and Samaria when in fact they're not. I think the propaganda since 93, and of course even before, that's been going on for almost 30 years, has convinced now many of the leaders that Israel is wrong, that Israel is making mistakes. They can't stand people screaming about the occupation, even though there is no occupation. This was never Arab land. And no Jewish leader, no Israeli leader, makes it pushes back on it. And I think that Jewish leaders are now tired of fighting. They think Israel is wrong. They've been convinced by the propaganda. It's affected them. And that's why they don't want to fight about the Hadi Amars and the uh, Mahar Bitars. They, they just want this uh, uh, Arab war against Israel to end. You actually think that the American Jewish leaders themselves have gone full on J Street, that they're basically, that's where they are, that they, they don't believe in the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in the land no, of Israel? No, of course they believe that, <laughs> but not in past the 67 line. They believe fervently we have to set up a Palestinian state. Uh, uh, many of the, the leaders will publicly, of course they, almost all, all of them support a two-state solution. ZOA is alone in opposing it because there'll be a terrorist state. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course they support Israel's right to exist within the 67 line, but they think Israel should unilaterally be giving land away and setting up a state thinking that'll end the problem. They ignore the fact that when that happened in Gaza, we got 25,000 rockets. Israel did uh, from uh, Hamas. It won't work. Appeasement has always failed throughout history. But yes, it's... do you do you think that do you think that um, that Israel is to blame for not for not standing up? For, I mean, do you think that if Israel were more forthrightly asserting its uh, asserting its rights to Judea and Samaria and the the strategic necessity of maintaining control over it, that American Jews would support? Would 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 change their views of these things? Israeli prime ministers should be sp speaking out loudly that there's no occupation, there was never such a country, <laughs> and discuss 
uh, all the issues proving there's no occupation. <laughs> they should be speaking out about Mahmoud Abbas. I speak at college campuses. All the kids think Mahmoud Abbas is a, is a, a, a middle, a mainstream peace seeker, a moderate peace seeker, when he's a monster, right? He, he calls the Jews filth. He's denied the Holocaust. He says no Jew will be allowed in the Palestinian state. He names school streets and sports teams after Jew killers. He's anti-gay. He's anti-woman. No one knows any of these things. <laughs> Why aren't the... Yeah, but I mean, let me just ask you, let me, let me just put it a little bit more clearly. I mean, you know, Netanyahu has come to the United States and made the case. Prime, President Trump's uh, um, deal of the century placed, you know, complete control for security in Judea and Samaria and Israel's hand and saw Israel asserting its sovereignty over 30 percent of Judea and Samaria from the outset of the plan. I mean, that that was the that was the deal that it was going to include that sovereign Israel would expand to include all of the areas of Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, as well as uh, the the eastern frontier of the country in the Jordan Valley. So, I mean, and, and the American Jewish community, re, their reception of the Trump plan was very cool at best. And but Israeli leaders have been. Um, I mean, in recent years, uh, I'm thinking of of Benjamin Netanyahu, I'm thinking of Ron Dermer. I mean, they have been making this case very, very strongly uh, from what I've seen, and yet nobody is willing to listen to them. I mean, it's not simply that Israel is making the case, and it seems as though the American Jewish community is not interested in hearing it. Netanyahu had a chance to declare sovereignty over small parts of Judea and Samaria. (laughs) He didn't do it. Netanyahu had a 10-month freeze he wouldn't build, sending a message, it's not really Jewish land. Why is he not building? And Netanyahu publicly proclaimed his support for Palestinian state, and which will be a terrorist state. Netanyahu has refused to build a single new community in Judea and Samaria or in Area E1, the area between Maladumim and Jerusalem to connect them. <laughs> Well, that's not actually true. I mean, more we. I mean, I don't want to get into the weeds, but there there have been a few communities that have been built in the past decade uh, by Netanyahu governments, and uh, the Jewish community of Judea and Samaria doubles under yeah, his. Yeah, doubled within so, I mean, the not, existing. I, I don't want the to, existing boundaries of those communities. Not not. Uh, I don't know. I mean, my community of Ephra, we have we have two new neighborhoods and that are further to the north, uh, closer to to Bethlehem. And, well, well, not, and, you know, I mean, it's not it's not all it's it's not all black and white. I mean, there has been a lot of building, but that that's not exactly the point. What I'm saying is that Israeli leaders have stated this, but I I, I do want to just get to another thing that I saw on the news that flashed just before we started this conversation, which was that. Uh, the the American Jewish leadership is has, I don't know whether you're included in that I kind of assume that you're not but I wanted to ask you about that that American Jewish leaders have been invited to the White House to meet with senior officials they won't say whom uh, this week to discuss rising anti-Semitism in the United States um, and um, first of all I wanted to ask were you are you on the guest list are you planning As on two of the, the White Jewish House leaders who are going said to me you see more you never should have on your website a list of all the hostile to Israel appointments that Biden's made. And that's why you're not invited. No, I have not been invited. <laughs> uh, uh, they consider me hostile. I can't say I'm... Uh, can... So you're hostile because you attack them for actually advancing anti-Semites. Right. And then, ha- so if so, here's, here's two questions that I want to ask you about that meeting to which you weren't invited. Were you, if you had been invited, what would you have said to whoever the senior uh, administration officials are there? I would have said, first of all, you should make it clear <laughs> that America will no longer fund the Palestinian Authority as long as they pay Arabs to murder Jews, as the Taylor Force Act requires. <laughs> uh, you should, you should, uh, that, that should be first. And uh, I would also, of course, talk about uh, the, 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 the trouble of him elevating Hadi Amar to a more important role, a man who's been extraordinarily hostile to Israel. <laughs> and why has he not appointed even a single person friendly to Israel in any of these important posts. Uh, and uh, for, uh, finally, I would say it is critically important for the administration to publicly condemn by name Ilan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Betty McCollum, AOC, Corey Bush, Jamal Bowman by name as vicious anti Semites, urge that they be thrown off of every committee and apologize. 
and Biden should apologize for publicly praising Rashida Tlaib, uh, uh, where he uh, uh, called her uh, a passionate woman, a fighter. God has blessed you for being a fighter. I think, uh, I think it, would, it would go, uh, when anti-Semites or people who feel negatively toward Jews see that there are a dozen now of, of, of anti-Semites in Congress and they get away with it and they're given respect the way this administration has, it only encourages them to go public and, and to be uh, 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 more open about uh, their hatred toward Jews and toward Israel. <laughs> that would be very important. But instead, they've embraced these people. And even Pelosi has refused to condemn any of them by name, just put out a general statement about anti-Semitism. And she took a picture with three of them for the cover of Rolling Stone magazine with three anti-Semites. That's what I would be saying to them. And I, by the way, I can assure you, none of that will be said uh, to these people, to, to Biden and his people at this meeting. They'll be too afraid. What, what, do you, what do you think, what do you expect will happen at this meeting? I don't know. I assume Joe Biden or his people simply reassert their commitment to a strong U.S. Israel relationship, you know, just a platitude, and uh, and uh, maybe say they'll speak out more about anti-Semitism in general, but they should be condemning by name Students for Justice in Palestine. They should be condemning Berkeley, which has allowed 14 clubs to say, if you support Israel's right to exist, we don't want you here. The administration should be condemning them publicly. They're not going to do it. And the Jewish leadership, I don't believe, is going to demand they do it. So I, I don't see anything positive coming out of this meeting. I hope I'm wrong. Well, I'm sure that they're going to condemn uh, Trump for meeting with Oh, Biden. they've done that, you know. Uh, but they never condemned Omar, Tlaib, AOC, or any of these other people. Uh, and and, and, and they, they would so, have if the Jewish leadership had demanded it. But Jewish leaders have said almost nothing about these people. Right. So I, I want to just I want to shift gears a second um, uh, to to what Abe Foxman, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt's uh, predecessor, longstanding head of the ADL, uh, said in an in an in an stunning interview with the J with the Jerusalem Post uh, uh, over the weekend. Um, he said that uh, his his support for Israel is conditional on uh, Israel essentially uh, not being led by the Likud. I mean, he, he, gave, uh, he, he gave a lot of, you know, uh, uh, ver he was very verbose in, in what he was saying, but I mean, it, it bo boiled down to brass tacks. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham Foxman said that if the Israeli government doesn't follow the line uh, that he supports in terms of domestic policy, in terms of religious policy, and in terms of its policy towards the Palestinians, uh, then, uh, you know, he's not going to support Israel anymore. And that really goes to the question of when I asked you, well, you, are they even Zionist anymore? I mean, it, it, what does that mean that your support for Israel is conditional? We're facing existential threats uh, uh, from several directions at once, starting with Iran moving to its proxies, Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, um, and also from genocidal anti-Semitism that is rising throughout the world uh, and that is predicated on Palestinian uh, on on Palestinian Jew hatred, which says that we don't we're not a nation, we don't have our history is fraudulent, which they you know appropriate to themselves and uh, that uh, our land belongs to them. Um, and so, you know, you look at this and you say, what do you mean your support for Israel is conditional? It seems so extraordinary to me. And he said it with a straight face. And obviously you look at his predecessor and, that, and the fact that he's essentially ended the ADL's existence as a Jewish, uh, as a Jewish organization and turned it into just a uh, progressive... Uh, a progressive uh, um, pressure group uh, against uh, against conservatives. So I, I mean, but he he really was always sort of seen as where the center of the American Jewish community is, and and he's saying that his support for Israel is conditional. How would you respond well, to that? First of all, what he's done, of course, is an absolute disgrace. I'm putting out a statement tomorrow condemning him for it. He's my friend. I know him very well. I mean, he sees uh, that the New York Times. Uh, has uh, hired a journalist, I don't even mention his name, who now writes articles that Israel shouldn't even exist. He sees that in a, allegedly you know, an important newspaper like the New York Times. He sees Tom Friedman saying that Israel isn't the, the Israel we used to know and love. He sees this. <laughs> and uh, 
uh, he wants to be, uh, he, I think he thinks this will make him more relevant. <laughs> uh, but it's remarkable. Why hasn't, he didn't condemn the extreme left-wing government we had with Ra'am in it, with Meretz in it, <laughs> and, uh, and the Lapid government. He said nothing. That was okay. Never condemned it. And here he's condemning, you know, uh, uh, a, a properly elected uh, religious Zionist uh, uh, party, <laughs> uh, uh, which is really just saying the right things that any nationalist Zionist Jew would be saying. Nothing extreme. I mean, uh, Ben Gabir says, why shouldn't Jews be allowed to, to pray in the Temple Mount if Muslims can? Of course they should be able to. And if someone is convicted uh, 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 of murder, there should be a death penalty. We have that here in this country. If someone, is, after serving a sentence as a terrorist, then that person should be deported. These are reasonable positions, not extreme right wing. What Foxman did was a disgrace. He only, uh, only gave strength and legitimacy to the Jew haters in this country, to the Jewish, to the anti-Israel organizations in this country. He should be ashamed of himself. If he was still the head of uh, ADL, we'd be calling for him to be fired. Uh, but you know, when you have the articles by Tom Freeman and this other fellow I don't want to mention, saying Israel shouldn't even exist, when you have Berkeley without any real pushback from Jewish organizations, uh, saying if you simply accept Israel's right to exist, you can condemn Israel's policies, you can be upset with everything Israel does, but if you accept Israel's right to exist, you cannot speak uh, to our clubs. There should have been enormous pushback on that. Uh, instead, the Jewish dean... Uh, uh, Chemerinsky, Erwin Chemerinsky, I think is his name, of Berkeley, simply said, I find their policy troubling. Troubling? It's, a, it's, a, it's an anti-Semitic disgrace. He should have immediately, as we demanded, thrown every one of them out as a student club because they get funded by the University of California, Berkeley. They're, they're given space. They should have immediately been thrown out. Just as when clubs and at various universities have said terrible things against women or, or gays, they lost their, their rights as a student club. You know, one of the things that's so stu stunning to me is that it, it, all of these statements are made without any attention being paid to what is actually happening on the ground in Israel. It's as if we're nothing happens here and nobody's responding to anything in the real world. I mean, just this just today it was reported I think in a really stunning way, we have a superintendent of police, uh, which is a, it's a police or inspector. I, it's a it's a police general. It's a it's a police version of the of a major general. He's the first Arab Muslim uh, um, Israeli with this rank. His name is uh, Jamal Chakrush, and he was actually forced to uh, re into a early retirement this year because in January he was filmed walking over the body of somebody who had just been critically wounded in a gunfight and just walking away and going to his car. And this is a guy who's supposed to be in charge of fighting crime in the Israeli Arab community. So, I mean, he just was so, he showed such incredible indifference to the suffering of, of a victim of crime. And so he was forced out. But uh, last week, I think it was, he participated in a, uh, in a rally uh, in in memory of 46 Arabs who were killed in Israel's War of Independence when they were fighting against uh, the IDF. So he was at a, mem a memorial commemorating 46 enemy soldiers from the War of Independence in a town in the Galilee, and the and the um, event was overseen by Raid Salah, who's the head of the Islamic movement in, in the northern branch. And he is a serial, he's an ex-con, and he'll probably be back in soon because he uses every pulpit that he stands in to incite for Israel's annihilation and for terrorist activities against Israelis. Uh, so he's already sat in prison for that. He was banned from entering into the UK because of his support for Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations. And here is this very senior so, you know, just the, the second tier after the, the, the top, the, the chief of police of Israel, as he's sort of in the police general staff, um, and he's uh, making common cause with uh, enemy soldiers and with enemies, open enemies of the state of Israel, uh, first and foremost, Raid Salah. And so these are the kinds of things that Israelis are looking at and having to contend with. And yet anybody who calls for making loyalty to the existence of the state a condition for employment in places like the police or the army 
or um, any, you know, any uh, place that has responsibility for the lives of Israel citizens is automatically referred to as a racist. And again, this is without any context, without any understanding of anything that's actually happening on the ground in the Israeli Arab community, which is increasingly irredentist and violent, as we saw last May when President Trump was congratulating Rashida Tlaib for being a warrior when she was siding with pogromists and Hamas terrorists against Israel in the middle of a military campaign and a terror campaign internally inside of sovereign Israel in mixed Arab Israeli Arab Jewish cities. Um, and so, you know, these are the kinds of things that people like Abe Foxman don't pay attention to. And two other people who aren't paying attention to them are, uh, of course, Aaron Dar David Miller and Dan Kurtzer, who wrote a stunning article in the Washington Post uh, last week where they called for a weapons embargo against Israel and for the United States to torpedo the Abraham Accords by punishing the Arabs who signed peace deals with Israel uh, and so uh, vacated the Palestinian veto of uh, Arab-Israeli peace and they called for the United States to end its support for Israel at the UN Security Council and at the International uh, Criminal Court at The Hague. Um, so these were these these are people who were supposedly interested in establishing peaceful relations between Israel and the Palestinians. One a former U.S. ambassador to Israel, Dan Kurtzer, and one a deputy Middle East uh, peace envoy over I think three different uh, U.S. administrations. Aaron Miller, and uh, now they're saying no, there's no peace, and so the United States should ditch any talk of peace goes straight for uh, a hostile policy towards Israel. It's pretty stunning. And they're not only prominent uh, foreign in the foreign policy establishment, they're also very prominent in the American Jewish community. So again, these are these are statements theirs together with Foxman, which indicate that the United States, that the American Jewish community is not that Kurtzer into Israel anymore. and Miller, Martin Indyk, Dennis Ross, have really been wrong about almost everything. They said Oslo may, will bring us peace. Arafat has changed. The Gaza withdrawal may bring us peace. They supported that. Uh, of course, they've been supporting a state since day one, uh, almost. Uh, I don't know why they have any credibility, why anyone wants to listen to them. Jewish organizations are constantly inviting Kurtzer and Aaron David Miller to come and speak and give and shed, let, let, share their wisdom when they've been wrong about everything. <laughs> no, that, that article was, uh, was ludicrous. And, and make no sense, makes no sense. And people don't realize, as you mentioned, the context. I think there's been seven terrorist attacks every day in the last nine months in Israel. Several terrorist terrorist attacks. That's the context. <laughs> and so it's Israel is not the same as America. It's, of course, we're getting there. <laughs> and uh, they have to really be worried about even just walking in the street. They have a whole different uh, set of issues they have to worry about, uh, unlike Americans. <laughs> And so they do not have the same types of uh, perspective as America does. And we, we should re be respecting that. But again, I think the Israeli leaders should be making clear that Mahmoud Abbas is a monster terrorist, that there's no occupation. I blame Jewish leaders and Israeli leaders for this situation. They're not educating the public with the truth of the Arab war against Israel. Well, I, I think you're right. Let me just ask you one la one final question for our conversation today. Um, what... Where is this leading the American Jewish community? It's interesting. There have been surveys where the Jews are asked the question, is Israel important to you? <laughs> Among the Orthodox, you get about 90% saying yes. The conservative, about 45% conservative Jews. Reform, 22%. 45 among conservative Jews, 22% among Reform Jews. The closer one is to caring about the Torah, our Bible, which is the basis of the Jewish people and the basis of Israel, uh, the, the closer people are uh, to Israel. I think we have to really be emphasizing in America more Jewish day school education, making it more affordable, having more Jewish day schools to teach kids this, because uh, uh, we, we are we're losing support of the Jewish people and the Jewish leadership for Israel, as you see now with this Foxman, Tom Friedman, and this other journalist, uh, who, by the way, sends his kids to day schools and, and yet comes out and says Israel should not exist as a Jewish state. So I'm... I'm Peter Beiner. <laughs> yes, I didn't want to mention his name. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want him to enjoy the fact that his name is mentioned. As, as, as I said before, Israel has to make it clear. 
his leadership. Mahmoud Abbas is a monster. We can't deal with them. They pay people to murder Jews. Jerusalem has never been holy to Muslims. It's not in the, in the Quran. Uh, uh, you know, there is no occupation. Explaining that there is no occupation. A Palestinian state would be a terrorist state. I mean, Syria, Iran, and North Korea have states. Are they lovely? A Palestinian state does not resolve anything. It only gives more strength uh, to promoting their agenda if they have their own sovereign state. All right. Well, I appreciate that very much, Morton. I think you're right. And I would also just add that I think that American Jews who don't understand the right of the Jewish people to their land, all of their land, um, are also not going to, and we're already seeing it on the street, are not capable of defending themselves in America um, against anti-Semitism that's actually targeting them, whether it's in the Palestinian-based form of uh, BDS or black supremacism or white supremacism, although white supremacism perhaps is a little bit easier to defend against. But if you don't know who you are and you don't know why you have rights, then you can't defend them when they're under attack. Well, thank you for your work. Your columns are a great educational tool for me. I learned so much from you and other Jews. You're one of the few people that told about the entire truth of the Arab-Islamic war against Israel and the West. So I'm grateful. Well, I appreciate that, and and I and and I and I commend uh, I commend the ZOA uh, for its vital work and for you leading it in that work for so many years. And we're going to have to have you back on soon. And uh, let's uh, just hope that uh, you know your voice is going to be resonating where it's supposed to be resonating in the well, hearts in the and last two of the weeks, American Jews. I've been, I've been quoted in the New York Times twice in the last two weeks, including the very front page. So we've been got, getting lots of media lately. <laughs> all right. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. And good luck with all your legal work fighting the anti-Semites. So again, thank you guys. Look at all the work that the ZOA does at zoa.org. And, uh, and Mort also writes quite often at the uh, at jns.org, as does uh, uh, Liz Burney, I think, who works with you and other uh, very excellent people at the ZOA. So I appreciate everything that you've done and, Susan, uh, and look forward Susan to Susan Tuckman, the head of her legal division, she was the, in the forefront of changing Title VI to cover Jews. So we, so we filed more lawsuits against universities because of anti-Semitism than any organization in America. And that was led by Susan Tuckman. So important. Such a great group. All right, well, guys, thanks so much for watching us this week. And we'll see you again uh, next week. Take care.